What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Kind of Funny X Cast, your home for all things Xbox here at Kind of Funny. I'm one of your hosts, Snowbike Mike, and today I am joined by my guy, Mr. Paris Lilly, back again. And Paris, you're looking good today. How you feeling though, my friend? No, I'm good. I'm I'm good. Um, it's uh been an interesting week, let's say. Okay, well, you know what, Paris? I have some news that's gonna continue that interesting week because we of course have the Xbox 20th anniversary celebration going on on Monday, November 15th, but things just got a little spicier. So uh, we're gonna keep that interest going here in just a little bit, but we'll talk about it. But Paris, I wanted to jump right into the show and talk to you about an insane collab. You know, you and I yeah. and Gary have talked about Xbox design products, Xbox limited design products. Well, now I think we take it to the next level because Xbox and Gucci have collaborated for a $10,000 special edition xbox that comes with some nice goodies so of course bear will be showing you that up on the screen this is called the xbox and gucci's collaboration xbox and gucci's first collaboration takes the house's beginnings in the world of sports and luxury to the next level with a hundred numbered xbox series x consoles and reimagined through archival details so right now you're seeing on your screen two customized xbox wireless controllers you have a Laser cut monogram motif Xbox Series X with the Gucci signs. And of course, a very, very special Gucci box to carry it all in. Paris Lily, the price tag, $10,000. Only 100 made. What do you think? I think my wife, who is not a gamer, this would be the first <laughs> gaming thing <laughs> she would absolutely be all over. I mean, it's cool. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's super pricey, obviously, but only 100 made. But hey, if, if, you, if you got it, spend it, right? I think, I think it looks cool. No, no doubt, Paris, right? If you got it, spend it. And I'm sure there's a bunch of people out there that love gaming, that have that kind of money. And it is really wild to see, right? I think this is one of those, the normal gamer kind of gawks and laughs at this of like, who is this for? This isn't for me. I could never buy a $10,000 Gucci collaboration, but it is really cool to see Xbox collaborate with these different groups. And, you know, next up that you and I are going to talk about is Xbox and the Adidas. And I was able to get my hands on the Xbox 364 mids. I woke up really early in the morning to order these and get them sent to me. And, you know, this is just one of those fun things that you and I have talked about so, so much is, yeah. exp you know, expanding the brand, celebrating 20 years and collaborating with different groups whether they be in fashion whether they be in different tvs or headsets whatever it may be but it is really cool to see and uh of course these four mids looking really cool paris what do you think about these oh no they're super dope super dope when i saw that it's been awesome to see that collaboration they've been doing that for the 20 year anniversary you know because I, I, I can't even remember since it's been a few weeks but you know they also xbox generously sent me the other adidas that they did mm -hmm. uh for the 20 year anniversary As a matter of fact i got them right here you got it right there. The, the low tops right yeah. here. These are yeah, the yeah. Uh, early 2000s skaters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, those inspired are good. ones. Those are and cool. those are very, very cool yeah. is right. right. Now, Paris, I have a question for you because everybody wants to ask me, Mike, what are you going to do with them? And you know, I have a problem with wearing oh, clothes that I buy and sneakers <laughs> that I buy. And I probably will never wear these. Are you going to wear those shoes? No, what? That's, they're, they're literally just sitting there. I'm, I'm afraid to wear them. <laughs> Not even at, like, like and, and of course, like, we were talking you know to Mike on the stream earlier today, and he was like, no, I'm, I'm going to get mud on these. Like, are you crazy? Like, we're not exactly. saying, like, go out to, like, hike in them or anything. But for, like, think about, like, showing them off for, like, a presentation, right? Or, Here's like, what I'll do. Yeah, yeah. Here's what I'll do. Uh. If I either win an award or present at the Game Awards mm. in December, I'll wear them. You'll wear them for that? All right. Oh, all right, all right. Okay, you'll wear them Mike, for that. I Mike, like that. what kind of event could we get you to attend that you would wear those for? If I host some sort of E3 or Xbox or video game related event, I will wear these, okay. right? Okay. Talking an eSports stage, talking an Xbox E3, talking Game Awards. If I host something, I would wear these, but I am not wearing these out because you think no. to yourself, yeah, right? definitely not for not, everyday use. Not for if you're not use. in the hosting mood, right? Let's let's talk about it, Paris. Right? If I'm not going to go up on stage, my one goal is to absolutely crush it on stage. That means I'm out in the crowd. That means I'm bumping elbows with people. We exactly. go to the bar. They're going to step sudden, on your feet. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. All no, of a sudden, no, no, Greg no. Miller spills his drink on yes. my shoes. Like Classic only Greg. if I was away from the madness would I wear these, and that's what I'm worried about. 
Yeah. So they, they will go up on the wall. So thank you, Pears. It actually feels good to hear Pears <laughs> say that. I want everybody to know that. It feels really good to have him say that. Mike I am and too Paris, afraid to wear these. We have some breaking news, and I don't know if it's what's going on here. No one really knows what's going on here, but we're going to go here to Twitter. We're going to type in Bring it up. Xbox, and I'm going to click on their account. This account no longer exists. Something happened to the Xbox Twitter. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. No way. Yeah. Cole Stein. Okay, well, we'll have to reach out to the Xbox um, marketing what? to see what is going that's, on with social media. That's insane. Yeah. Hold on. No, I got to go type and look. So okay, I don't know okay. if it's been purposely deleted for some, like, marketing bit or uh, what's going on here, but Xbox, at Xbox on Twitter. It is gone. Yeah, it is gone. gone. I can't confirm. Wow. I've clicked over on mine. It is gone. A Xbox Canada still exists. Okay. Okay. Well, well Xbox Canada, shout out. We'll hold it down yeah. for all of us. It's right. It, Xbox Canada is now the new official site. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, we're going to keep you updated throughout the show if this changes within the next hour of us recording keep, the show. I'll keep if my not, eye on it. I'll keep we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll look around. But let's jump into Whoa. it. Of course, this is the kind of funny X cast we post each and every Saturday at 6 a.m. West Coast, Best Coast time on YouTube.com slash kind of funny games, roosterteeth.com, and on podcast services around the globe. Don't forget, you can support kind of funny in a magnitude of awesome ways whether you're watching on youtube please hit that subscribe button it's totally free maybe you catch some of our live daily content over on twitch.tv slash kind of funny games you can hit that subscribe button and if you're supporting us here on patreon like a number of our incredible community do you can watch shows live you can interact with us you can write into reader mail and do so many awesome things through patreon but also a new way to support us here at kind of funny that's totally awesome is our epic partnership. Don't forget, if you're buying V-Bucks for Fortnite, if you're elevating your Rocket League cosmetics, or if you're buying anything off the Epic Game Store, you can use our Epic Creator Code, kind of funny, at checkout. It's no additional cost to you. We'll get a portion of that purchase, and you can support us in a brand new, awesome way. And like I said, it's no additional cost to you, so why not use it if you're buying some cool games or buying V-Bucks? But talking about Patreon, we'd like to thank our Patreon producers for the month of November for their support. Pranksky, Tyler Ross, Delaney Twinning, Julian the Gluten-Free Gamer, Alex J. Sandoval, James Hastings, and Casey Andrew. This week, the Kind of Funny X-Cast is sponsored by Honey, Chime, Native, and Arcane, but me and the team will tell you all about that a little bit later, because guys, gals, everybody listening, we got a great show for you. Today, we are celebrating the Xbox 20th anniversary with the man, the myth, the legend, the man who created the original Xbox and his good friend, Tom Russo. So you're going to see Seamus Blackley on the show. Seamus Blackley and Tom Russo will join myself and Paris Lee on the back half of this episode to talk about Xbox 20th anniversary, talk about the creation of the Xbox console, talk about how they impacted the cultural, cultural of America and video games during that time period back in the early 2000s. And it is a really awesome conversation. It's a cool interview that you don't want to miss, filled with a lot of fun stories. Paris, am I right on the fun story part? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you're definitely <laughs> right about that. <laughs> a lot of fun stories, so please make sure to keep it locked to that. And as I hinted to before, we're going to have some Halo Infinite news that you don't want to miss out, especially if you're listening in on Saturday or Sunday. This will impact your Monday watching, so make sure to keep an eye out and listen in. But Paris, let's kick off with some really positive news, something really, really exciting, and that's Forza, Forza Horizon 5's very impressive launch week that we're seeing right now let's start with phil spencer who tweeted on launch day tuesday he wrote we've invested for years in xbox so so more people can play with 4.5 plus million players so far across pc cloud and console forza horizon 5 shows that promise coming to life largest launch day for xbox game studios game peaks at concurrent three times forza horizon 4 heights and thank you to players and congratulations, we are Playground Games. 4.5 plus million players by launch day. Paris, I checked late last night on Thursday night. They're sitting at about around six and a half million players right now on their it's Hall higher. of Fame leaderboard. I I bet you higher. What did you see? Did you see it go? Uh, up to it, it, it was it was seven million. Yeah, it's over seven now. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. seven plus million players in this first week of launch. A 92 on the Metacritic score. Of course, me and Be me and uh, Blessing had the review last week for the yep. Kind of Funny X-Cast. We got to share our early impressions, our thoughts coming out of the preview window. Now we turn to it. It's been about a week out, and we haven't heard from you. 
What are your thoughts on the game? I, I think it's phenomenal. It's it's fantastic. I think one of the the tweets I, I just put out, it is easily one of the most visually impressive games I've ever seen. Um, just just from a technical standpoint, but even from a gameplay standpoint, just the different biomes, just the open world of Mexico that you're able to just just just, just get in the car and just go drive. Obviously, there's the different events and everything that you can do. The fact that the drive avatars, I, I feel like this. The driver tar started off almost like a gimmick. God, I don't know how many years ago now, you know, whatever Forza Motorsport that was, to where I feel like now it, it's matured so much. It's just so cool to see all your friends with you, whether they're really there or yeah. not. And they, they, all these different driver tars have their own personalities. Like, shout out to Godfrey because he tries to run me off the road all the time. I, th- I think he knows. But, uh, you know, it's it's phenomenal. It's it's a phenomenal game. This is why you're seeing over seven million people playing it. Um, they've playground. I mean, just kudos to playground games. I mean, they've really just hit on something. And this being the fifth iteration of the Horizon series, I I just feel like you know they they have the experience and they've kind of just hit their stride to where you know I expect Forza Horizon to be good every time we see one now because it's just where the series is. And, you know, you're going to get hours and hours of entertainment, whether you're just by yourself with your friends, the dra- like I said, drive tars, all that stuff. Um, so, again, just kudos to Playground Games. I, they knocked it out of the park. I, I do believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, it is the highest rated game this year. Pretty sure it is. For if all it's games? N- yeah, yeah. If it's, not okay. high, if it's not number one, it's number two. It's, it's right there. And that is, again, a credit to Playground Games and everything that they've done with the Forza Horizon series. And I also say this. Um, I think a lot of the reason you're seeing that 7 million is the fact that it is on console, it is on PC, and it is on cloud. I think that has a lot to do with it, which kind of goes back to this vision that Xbox started in 2016 with Xbox Play Anywhere. We're seeing the fruits of that labor now because it's about playing games where you want to play them. And if you bring the games to where people want to play and you give them a quality product, they're going to go pick it up, be it. And look, it ain't even about Game Pass because we saw the pre sales num- you know, numbers before quote unquote launch day happened on Tuesday. There were already millions of people that had picked up Forza Horizon and they purchased it. It wasn't about Game Pass. They were getting it because it was a quality game. And obviously you had that whole early access window. So yeah, I mean, this 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 is a great sign as we move forward, you know, since this is an Xbox show, as we look at Xbox Game Studios and the titles that are coming, we obviously know Halo's about to drop and then all the stuff we're going to start seeing in 2022. You know, if the, look, now now I have an expect a quality expectation level, right? This, this if you're if you're telling me I'm going to start to get this stuff, you know, between Psychonauts 2 and now Forza Horizon, I'm sure we're going to talk about Halo Infinite campaign that IGN had here in just a second, but if this is the cadence that we're going to start to see coming from Xbox Game Studios, pretty exciting time. Really is. Really exciting time. And you touched on two things that I would love to talk about and that is first off the ecosystem. That's something I've been playing on the cloud Paris on my phone late at night for the past four nights now. And I am truly impressed. You can really feel the improvement as we've touched on over the past couple of months as they move those server farms onto the Xbox Series X blades, Mm -hmm. right? You can tell the difference. The game runs better. It loads faster. It feels good on a solid internet or 5G connection. And it is really impressive because we're talking about a massive first-party launch title day and date on the cloud that you can play anywhere, right? And I don't need to have a PC. I don't have to have a console. I can play it from my phone or you no, know, on the other ones, I can stream it, right? And it's one of those where it's like, man, this is really special and it elevates the player base so much. And I'd love to see those numbers of how many people really take advantage of that, but it is a really cool option to have. And I think it's one of those special ones as we talk about another game that might have a soon to be reveal from Jeff Grubb in a, a small tease. I think is really going to play big numbers with certain kind of social and more family friendly games that we'll talk about soon. But I love the ecosystem as you brought up and the ways to play. Another one is the driver tars. Paris, this is a game and I'm going to be a little critical right here that has struggled with the multiplayer and connection yes. side mm-hmm. of things right now at launch. And that might be due to seven plus million players. 
It might be some other things. But right now, trying to play online with your friends is a headache, right? There's times where it works and it feels good. And there's a lot of times where you get a, I'm trying to reconnect to the server, run a diagnostic test all the time, right? And it is a little disappointing on that end. But I think the driver tars over the past couple of games in Forza make it feel like I am playing with friends, even though I'm not, right? I love that it's not just a random car or Joe Blow name. Putting my friends list and putting the names that I know as driver tars around me makes it feel so much more connected and makes it feel like, oh man, I'm not alone. And I love that feeling, Paris. Agreed. Now, one thing I forgot to say is um, I primarily played this on PC and, you know, I, I have a high end rig playing it ultra settings it, i mean it, it's just a showcase it's just yeah. an absolute showcase title in that sense but i have also played it on the series x and the s and again it's it, it looks fantastic on the on the x and even the s you know th- this again just goes to show you if you're not worrying about 4k and all that kind of stuff i mean you you can get a great experience on, on the s and it, it plays just fine it's where my son plays all the time is on the s but um, yeah, I mean, like I said, it is definitely one of the more visually impressive games um, that we've seen. And it also made me think, just looking ahead, remember, this is a, a cross-generational title. You can play this on Xbox One as well, which I have not, so I can't comment on that. But imagine what the next-gen Forza Motorsport is going to be like if they're already doing this. And then I, I tweeted this, and then people also brought up the fact they're going to use the same engine for Fable as well. Yep. which will also be a next-gen only title. So imagine a few years down the road when we start seeing those games and just where the fidelity and the visual quality is going to go. So Because obviously, uh, I forget the exact name of, of the engine. It's called Fours or whatever. But, I mean, clearly this thing can scale. So I, I'm, I'm excited for the future and to see what it's going to be able to do. Yeah, that was the coolest part, Paris, of leaving this first week behind and seeing the energy and the enthusiasm around what Playground Games created for Forza Mm -hmm. Horizon, right? And then also, as you look at it, I think Forza Horizon, as I've touched on before, I'm not a big racing fan, but this game gets me into the racing mood and it gets me excited for the future. And you bring up Turn 10 and what they could be doing with the next Forza Motorsports and what that will look like and play like. And that gets people like me who are on the fence or just kind of a, a casual fan, gets me excited to jump into that knowing it will be on Game Pass, and it's going to be a visual feast that we all can enjoy. And another mm-hmm. one is people are excited about Fable now. People believe that this team is going to do something really, really special yep. in Fable. And you can clearly see it clear as day. They they have the groundwork and the foundation to create something awesome, which is cool. Also, I did, well, uh, I did look up. Um, it is at number six on best reviewed games uh, on Metacritic this year. But the top five... I think are all technically re-releases. So you got oh. Disco Elysium, The Final Cut, The House in uh, Feta Morgana, Dreams of Revenance Edition, which I believe sounds like a re-release of a, of a game. Then you got Tetris Effect Connected, and then 4 and 5 are both Hades on Xbox and uh, PS5. Uh, so as far as like new releases, yeah, it is the best-reviewed uh, game of the year, it seems. And at number two, Psychonauts 2. Yeah, yeah, I knew Terrific. Psychonauts 2 was, right. was high up there as well, which again, hey, this is an Xbox show, you know, we can talk about this. I mean, we're seeing, it's, it's funny, during the pandemic, we've had so many delays, but then as, we, as the dust is starting to settle on 2021, this almost feels like a redemption moment for Xbox Game Studios, where the, the knock on them has been, Xbox has no games, 2021, they've had a lot of great games, and the games they do come out are just mediocre. I mean, like we said, basically they have the two highest rated games of the year. And then you could even throw Flight Simulator in there too, but that one doesn't really count because, you know, it was already on PC last year. But the point remains, we're we're starting to see, and I'm going to be fascinated to see what Halo Infinite ultimately turns out to be. But so far, so good, I I would say, for Xbox Game Studios in 2021. And we already see what's coming in 2022, so a lot to be excited about. And that is the next big show-stopping centerpiece. We're going to talk about it right now, Halo Infinite, because IGN has the IGN first coverage of Halo Infinite campaign coverage. Of course, the incredible Miranda Sanchez is covering that over at Havoc Rose and uh, some others as well. Of course, you'll see Ryan McCaffrey talk about it and Destin Legary currently, but they have a full month of IGN first coverage mm-hmm. coming your way throughout the month. And I want to jump into it. And Miranda has an awesome write-up. She has a great 11-minute long video with gameplay. But Paris, 
I know you and you're looking for the story. And so I know a lot of people out there, we've already gone hands-on with multiplayer. We know what the gameplay is like, and it's really cool. I don't want to read all of Miranda's work because I want you to go check it out. So if you're looking forward to gameplay, exploration, you know, bosses, uh, iconic weapons and specialty weapons, go read all about that because she touches on everything. But I focused for you, Paris, on the story. And Miranda knows story, of course. She's looking to see if 343 will land it. So I took a couple excerpts from her piece over on IGN that kind of focused on the story. And I want to touch and see how you feel about that from her writing and what we can expect coming up next month. But this is what she wrote over on IGN. The biggest surprise I had coming out of my few hours with Halo Infinite campaign hands-on wasn't the delightful exploration nor the incredibly fun gunplay paired with Infinite's new equipment. Instead, it came down to the characters. Halo Infinite sees the legendary Master Chief once again tasked with saving the universe from yet another threat, and after five major campaigns, the Chief seems tired, sad even. He's a man with few words, but his movements and cutscenes and response to those who need him are heavier than I've ever seen. This is Chief without Cortana. His subtle yet distinct change is far from a bad thing, though, if anything, Master Chief's forlorn demeanor uh, that he sets aside to get the job done is a great indication to me that Halo Infinite's story is intended to be more impactful adventure. Without getting into spoilers, I will say the few moments that dug into Chief and Cortana's relationship were an emotional gut punch. And I know that's something special for you, Paris. Rounding it out at the end, I have thus far only explored a fraction of Halo Infinite. Though the map isn't as large as an Assassin's Creed or Red Dead, far from it, I'd say what it does hold seems to offer something more curated to an excellent combat at its heart. It's closer to a Batman Arkham game in terms of its, quote, open world than the aforementioned games. After my time with it, I can say I'm confident I'll enjoy the exploration part of Halo Infinite. The story part is what I'm most curious about. Someone very similar in your thinking and mine as well, Paris. But when you hear that gut punch moment between Chief and Cortana, this story you've talked about has to nail. How does this write up? How does this IGN first coverage come to you? How do you feel about that? that that's exactly what I was hoping to hear. And, and again, Miranda, ph phenomenal job by her with that write up. And I also got to watch the video with her and Ryan kind of describing, you know, what they got to play as well. Great job by both of them. But uh, but yeah, that that's what I wanted to hear, because, you know, we, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. I think we're saying goodbye to Cortana, to Cortana. So you want that gut punch. And and like like she also said, as far as with Spartan 117, I mean, yeah, we've been with this guy for 20 years. And, you know, let's just, you know, pretend he's gone through 20 years of war. So he should be tired. He should be worn down. He should have that experience and that like like she described his his movements through all that. And we even saw some of that. Um, during the E3, a uh, little bit of footage to show during E3 where you see Chief and all the dead Marines and as he's navigating through them and carefully, you know, like you know, like replacing them, and, you know, as he has to get to his objective, you know, that's someone that, that has been through war. He, there was no panic from him. He knows the job has to get done. And everything that she talked about and described sounds like that's what we're going to see, you know, when we're actually playing as Chief going on what was it zeta halo so yeah i mean it, it looks like this story is going to have an emotional impact like i said a couple of weeks ago i hope i shed a tear when the credits roll i really do i because i do think we're saying goodbye to cortana um it was interesting how she said at least obviously in the in the early time she's played the focus was on the banish it was very little cortana i would imagine probably by the time we get to the back end of the game you know she'll play a bigger part whatever that's going to be. But um, I'm really, I'm looking forward to it. Re really looking forward to it. Um, the way she described the weapon made a lot of sense to me as well. So looking forward to see those interactions. But um, it seems like th when we talk about redemptions, it seems like this again is the opportunity for 343 to make Halo their own, to really take ownership from it. And we're not just comparing it to the past of what Bungie has done. Whereas now they've taken it take it you know they, they they've they've you know lived up to the legacy of what bungie created but now they've taken it in, in a direction that we can all be excited about and 
obviously want want to see you know where it goes from there but so far so good on on what we heard um from miranda so can't wait for more <laughs> i really can't i'm really i you know, like i said before i've gone from skeptic to like i gotta get my hands on this thing i, I really want to play it and see the story Heck yeah. That's what I wanted to hear, Paris Lilly. I could hear it in your voice. I could see it in your face. I'm excited about it. And most importantly, go check out Miranda and IGN's work because there's a lot of cool stuff to dive into and it will make you smile front to back. But if I can add on to that, yeah. um, and this is more so when it was Miranda and Ryan uh, describing gameplay. Um, you know, a lot of people, when we've watched the campaign footage, you know, there was a lot of Far Cry comparisons. Whereas I did find it interesting how Ryan described it. This is, they're definitely not doing that. Like they're being careful to not call this open world, but it sounds like it's open world, but it's mm. not the go to, go to objective A to B. You like, it, it's, it's not the Far Cry formula where it does feel like you have more freedom to where, all right, if I want to tackle the, the campaign story, I can, but there's going to be all these side things we can do. And we, we kind of called it a couple of weeks ago where you're going to run into these encampments and then you take them over and that's almost going to be like a fast travel point where you can go and you can call in vehicles and weapons and things like that. And you, it looks like the gameplay loop is you have the creative freedom to tackle those objectives the way that you want. Like Ryan stayed back and kind of picked people off, but he could have rushed in if he wanted to. And it, you know, you would have had the same result at the end. So I'm excited for that. I'm excited for that sandbox to be able to go in. And I loved how Miranda said she plays on heroic because that's basically what I do. But thinking it was, oh, this is this is a piece of cake. And then she ran into basically the first boss and was like, uh-uh, it's not a piece of cake anymore. <laughs> so that that made me excited because I, I want to see some difficulty challenges with heroic. And then obviously, you know, for the real challenge, you'll you'll go up to legendary. So again, I just, I just want to get my hands on it at this point so I can I can judge for myself. But you know, I you know, I I trust Miranda, always respect her opinion. So if she's excited, that gets me excited too. Paris, up behind me, I have the Halo 3 Special Edition. I have yeah. the Halo Reach Special Edition. And these are near and dear to my heart. And I know Halo fans love that Master Chief helmet, right? It's very, very yeah. special. We have found out this week that there will not be a quote-unquote official Halo Infinite Special Edition. Over on Twitter, there was the tweet coming from a Halo fan that tweeted at Sketch, one of the community, members, mem or community managers of 343, and mm -hmm. asked, can you shine any light on this? Is there an actual collector's edition that will be officially announced? Of course, he had a photo collected with that from Walmart. Walmart right now has a special edition up that has the actual sword as a light for your nightstand. It has another other goodies in here. But Brian wrote back and said, since a few folks have been asking about this, I can confirm that while various retailers around the world are expected to offer their own custom bundles, there is not an official collector's slash ultimate edition for Halo Infinite. Check your favorite retailer for options. Paris, I know we are going deep into an all digital world, but as you look at this, and I know we have the special edition controller and the special edition console, but is this a miss right here, not having that collector slash ultimate edition? Are we going to lose that for the future? Is that gone into the wayside? Yeah, see, I'm the wrong person to ask on this because. I mean, it's funny. I, I, I have the Halo hel helmet. It's uh, out in the other, other room. That's, I'm not super big on, on the collector's editions for these things. I mean, I know they're coming out with a custom Series X and things like that. I, I do think we're getting more to a digital age to where those mm -hmm. things are, are, are minimized. Like, you know, obviously we're doing a 20 years of, you know, of Xbox. So it's almost like 20 years ago, I'd have been super excited about it. But not so much now, but I do think I'm an exception to the rule. I think there, there are definitely a lot of co collectors out there that would like to see something like that. But I think in the current climate that we're in right now and the supply strains and things, and obviously this game, you know, this game got delayed a year anyways, maybe, maybe it would have been a challenge to have enough readily available. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm just spitballing at this point. So it is a little bit of a surprise, but I don't know. I don't, I don't think enough. I don't know. I don't know. It's hard to say. I just, I haven't seen a lot of people, you know, clamoring for that. But like I said, we are going to get the special edition controller and the, and the console and things like that. So maybe, maybe that's enough. I don't know. 
Yeah, it is really interesting. Of like, I've gone all digital, right, Paris, and it's very difficult to get me to go buy a physical edition or buy the yeah. collector's edition. But you know, when I look up at that helmet, right, from Halo Three, and I see just how beautiful it is and how special it is, and I think of Halo and the 20th anniversary and how special that is to all of the Xbox gamers and a big release like Infinite. It is odd that we don't see something like that, right? It is something that I think we're slowly getting away from. You'll see some teams still do it, but it is it feels a little odd having the biggest property from Xbox not have something like that. So yeah. I look forward to seeing what each retailer does. Of course, we've seen Walmart, like I said, they have kind of a desk lamp that is the uh, the sword that you can uh, light up, but we'll see what other teams do. But I don't know if we'll ever have those days again, is right, Paris, where you have this big helmet behind me and it's sold like that, especially also if I move away, the Titanfall collector's edition I have, I'll never forget the box that I got that in. I think we're far from that ever again. Now, that's something I always wanted and I never got. I, I actually- Paris, I'll, I'll be down to drop this off at your house then if you want it. Because <laughs> I will, I'll give you mine, Paris. You're the best. Uh, let's do one more, Paris. I got two stories I want to just quickly smash on you. One from Halo and then one other side one. So we got some wildfire. We got a yeah. crazy rumor spreading yeah. that happened this morning, and there's still no official word. I have no idea what's happening, Paris. And you are the man with your ear to the street. You are the man that just takes a deep breath and says, here's the real deal, y'all. Calm down. So, Paris, we got to talk about it. It started this morning, first up from a Twitter account called Halo.API on Twitter that just tweeted out, Heroes of Reach, November 15th, 2021, indicating that they thought Halo Infinite multiplayer would launch on November 15th, the 20th anniversary, this Monday. And so they had a couple of tweets regarding that. There was a Reddit post about it that people said, yo, this is a known leaker, and they are legit. They actually leaked a number of Halo multiplayer maps alongside uh, IGN before IGN had the coverage there. So it is somebody that's semi-reputable. Then after that, we had a tweet come up from Nate the Hate 2 which people say is a known leaker on the Nintendo side, said on the tweet, what better way to celebrate the anniversary of Xbox than with a birthday surprise? I can independently confirm and share with you today that Halo Infinite multiplayer will be made available on Monday, November 15th, suit up Spartans. Now, Paris, there's a lot going into this, right? These are kind of smaller Twitter accounts right here. People can vouch for them, but it doesn't really seem like they have any sort of like clear and day evidence to really push this narrative forward on a Monday. But then all of a sudden, somebody who I like to follow and I can respect, Tom Warren tweeted out, did someone ruin Master Chief's birthday present? Question mark. Paris, are we really getting Halo Infinite multiplayer on Monday? Is that what this is leading to? I, I, I've learned in the past couple of years, nothing would surprise me. Absolutely okay. nothing. Wow. So, okay. so, so could it happen? Absolutely it could happen. But do I think they're going to give us the full gambit of every map, every mode? All right, let's stealth launch the battle pass as an example, cross PC and con like that seems like a lot. That seems very ambitious to just drop out of nowhere on a, on a Monday. Um, I would guess maybe you get a limited selection of maps and modes. Oh. Just, okay. just to kind of wet the appetite, kind of wet your beak a little bit, you know, until until the uh, December eighth. I, to me, that makes more sense than surprise. You don't get the campaign, but we're giving you all of the multiplayer. Basically, what three weeks early, three or four weeks early, or whatever, weeks, whatever yeah. that is. Yeah. So, I'm gonna lean towards no, not the full thing, but nothing will shock me. Absolutely nothing. I like that approach there, Paris. I'm going to ride with you. Nothing will shock me in this day and age. Uh, a lot of question marks there, Paris, as I kind of pull back and look at the bigger picture, right? Call of Duty has been now out for a full week. We have Battlefield with the full launch next week on the 19th, right? Yeah. So that would now put Halo four days before Battlefield, stealing that, you know, that team's thunder. And we've seen with Phil, right? He likes to play nice with everyone. He doesn't want to steal the thunder of others. They really want to be inclusive to everyone and it would be an odd move to really take away the hype from battlefield and we talk about the big three if that would be the move to release your free-to-play multiplayer on their week right and i personally think 
that Halo is poised to have a great launch because right now, as you're seeing, Call of Duty is running the gambit in the first-person shooter space. After about two weeks, people will be burnt out looking for the new thing. Battlefield is that question mark that we'll talk about next week during that full release of like where it stands as the, as the product that it is. But Halo is three to five weeks away from both of those releases, and they have time to wait and take back the holiday season. Two things, because I know we're about yeah. to get out of here. First one with regards to Halo, because I, 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 I'm, I'm literally thinking, because I'm staring, because I have the Xbox app up, so I'm staring at Halo Infinite multiplayer coming December 8th. It says right here, right? Could you imagine them on Monday saying, oh, and by the way, you can play Halo Infinite multiplayer right now. Every server, Azure server across the globe will melt. On fire, Paris, you know that. Like, if you give everyone zero heads up and everyone's trying to download this all at once, it will, it will. I, I, can't, I can't imagine that. I just can't, I can't. I can't imagine them not giving people a heads up. Servers you know, will be on that. fire, Paris. I yeah. have a question for you. I know I'm trying to keep us tight here. One final question. Could this maybe be sold as a Game Pass perk? Hey, everybody, if you're subscribed to Game Pass right now, you can play Halo multiplayer and then free to play goes live December or does I, that I, I, less I, in the I, free to play? Yeah. I just sense the anger already. Okay, Exactly. I, That's what I'm, I'm getting I'm, at, I'm right? Literally, I'm literally a Jedi. I feel <laughs> your anger. I can just hear it already. If they were, again, if you stealth did this like that, I don't know. We'll, look, we'll, we'll see on Monday, I guess. Right. I, I don't know. I'm X cast again, listeners. No rules. I don't know. We'll it, see. It is fun of, this wildfire of this rumor, rumor now really incites you to tune in on Monday morning, right? Yeah. Now it's like, I have to see what Phil and this team could do. Yeah. It could be something crazy where I got to run home and download this game. Yeah. Paris, I want to keep you for just one extra story. We got to run out of here. But we have new game details for a couple of unannounced games that we'll talk about next week from our good friends, Jez Corden over at Windows Central. And of course, a good guy, Jeffy Grub Grub, Jeff Grub over at Games Beats. But they're talking about Project Midnight and obsidian's pentiment this pro these two projects coming up but we got to talk about the third project because that's the one that could be shown on monday that might be something special and it's the return of the fan favorite one versus 100 so i'll read mm -hmm. directly from games beat and jeff grubb be cool everybody because one versus 100 may soon make a comeback the company's alt space vr team is working on the project with full support from the xbox game division alt space vr most recently made headlines for its mess project that creates a micro-sized metaverse in Microsoft Teams. The plan is to take similar avatars from the product and use them to build a new version of One Versus 100. Xbox executives are excited about One Versus 100 and want it to loop back into Xbox Live. This is something that Xbox boss Phil Spencer teased back in 2020. Do you think this is real? And if this is real, could we see it as soon as Monday or is this a ways off, Paris? I think it's a ways off. Yeah, I, I do think it's real. I, I, I would think it would be a ways off. Maybe it, it's officially announced Monday, but I don't think, oh my God, jump in and play on Monday. Um, and uh, if you're looking for a host, uh, I know a guy. <laughs> How about Paris that? Lilly, he's pretty great. He's pretty great, everybody. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 do, I do think, I do think it, it makes sense. I mean... Everyone loved it at the time. I forget the reason why it went away, but I could definitely see it coming back. Absolutely. Paris, it's a very special one, and it's something that we've talked about here on the Xcast a lot. It's brought a lot of Xbox gamers together and really has captured that Xbox Live moment that we actually talk about in our upcoming interview with Seamus Blackley and Tom Russo uh, that you'll hear in just a minute. But it's really, really special, and I hope Jeff Grubb is leading us in the right direction. And I'm sure it's hard to resist bringing back one versus 100 if you're the Xbox team. So I bet you this is happening. We'll look forward to that official announcement. But let's take a word and listen in from our sponsors. And then I'm going to hit you with an awesome interview celebrating Xbox 20th anniversary with the man who created the original Xbox, Seamus Blackley, and his friend, Tom Russo. See you in a minute.
This episode is brought to you by Arcane, the Netflix original series from the creators of League of Legends. Arcane is a nine episode, three part series that follows the story of two young girls, Vi and Powder, who were born in the undercity beneath Pill Over. Their eagerness to prove themselves sets a series of events in motion that take their relationship to its breaking point and transforms them forever. Witness the animation event of the year and see the champions you know and love like never before. Vi, Jinx, Hammerdinger, and Jace's stories will all intertwine in this action-packed series. Whether you've played League of Legends for ages or if you're brand new to Rune Terra, Arcane is the perfect introduction to League of Legends' vast worlds, following the origins of some of its most iconic characters. Uh, it dives into the stories behind one of the most played games of all time, and now you can too. Prepare for the epic battle that's only the beginning. Arcane is now streaming exclusively on Netflix. Next up, shout out to Native. It's the best smelling season of the year. And thanks to Native's new seasonal scents, you guys are gonna be able to smell real good, just like I do everywhere I go. We're talking about deodorant. Native deodorant is formulated with ingredients that you know and love, like shea butter and coconut oil. They never use parabens, aluminum, or sulfates. Get out of here, no. Yet, it keeps you smelling amazing all day. They've got classic scents, and now their holiday-inspired collection like candy cane, sugar cookie, and fresh mistletoe. And it's not just us at Kind of Funny that love Native. They have over 15,000 five-star reviews. Gia loves Native. She she loves all this stuff and she smells good all the time. She actually got me using it. She inspired me and now we're a really good smelling family. That all rhyme. Keep the scents of the season with you with Native's limited time holiday scented deodorants. Go to nativedeodorant.com and use code KFGAMES to get 20% off your first purchase at checkout. That's nativedeodorant.com code KFGAMES for 20% off nativedeodorant.com. Use the code KFGAMES. And next up, shout out to Honey. Shopping online from your PJs is the best unless you're doing it without honey because honey is the free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best ones it finds to your cart honey supports over 30,000 stores online from tech and gaming sites to fashion brands and even food delivery it's also super simple to use when you go to check out the honey button drops down all you got to do is click apply coupons if honey finds a working code you just watch the prices drop uh, just last week I was buying some new furniture for the studio and honey saved me hundreds of dollars it's so fantastic fantastic, so easy to use. I've been using it for years and I am never going to stop. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in just a few seconds. By getting it, you're doing yourself a solid and supporting this show. You guys should check it out. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash kinda. That's joinhoney.com slash kinda. Kinda. And finally, shout out to Chime. Did you know that in 2019, traditional banks made $11 billion in overdraft fees? That is a bonkers number. But Chime does things differently. Chime is an award-winning app and debit card that saved its members over $10 billion in overdraft fees with Spot Me Fee Free Overdraft. Uh, you deserve to have financial peace of mind. Join the millions of Americans already loving Chime. Sign up takes only two minutes. That doesn't affect your credit score. Uh, get started today at chime.com slash kf games that's chime.com slash kf games banking services provided by and debit card issued by the Bancorp bank or stride bank na members fdic spot me eligibility requirements apply overdraft only applies to debit card purchases and cash withdrawals limits start at 20 dollars and may be increased up to 200 by chime chime member overdraft fee savings based on eligible members use of spot me versus 33 dollar average overdraft fee overdraft fee data based on bank rate checking account survey and crl june 2020 overdraft fee report remember chime.com slash kf games hey everybody right now we are joined by two awesome guests alongside myself and paris lily and we're going to talk all about xbox 20th anniversary and a fun little story about friendship video games and the culture around video games that these two might have spearheaded here in the united states so we'll talk all about it but of course i am joined by seamus blackley the creator of the original xbox and his friend tom russo who we quote as a highly critical cheerleader of the original Xbox project, <laughs> but is business development for Digital Eclipse and other Ocean Group. Tom, I'll start with you. How are you feeling today, my friend? Oh, I'm feeling great. And thanks for having me here, Mr. Snowbike. Yeah, oh, it's great to have you. And I, I'm really excited for the energy because your good friend Seamus Blackley has brought it here before the interview has begun. Seamus, how are you feeling today, my guy? I'm good, man. I'm good. It's really good to, uh, really good to see you guys. And as I was saying earlier, it's weird. Because usually when I'm I'm talking at the screen when you guys are on you don't respond and now it's kind of interesting and weird that you're actually listening to me so that's a good change. 
It's a nice change. We get to all hang out together. And I know Paris is excited to have you both alongside myself. But we should start from the beginning. We look back. It's almost November 15th, 20 years of Xbox. And Seamus, you are the man touted as the creator of the original Xbox, one that I have up on the wall. And many people listening to this podcast will remember fondly. But also the man standing next to you, Tom. You have a is dev you kit on your, on your wall. You have uh, a green dev kit. That's pretty cool. That's I actually, not bad. Yeah. It, not bad, not bad. And so your friend joining us, Tom, you two have a friendship that was built through Xbox and really because of you creating the Xbox. So I guess let's start with how did this friendship begin and where did Tom come into the picture? Well, I knew Tom for a long time uh, because I've been making games for a long time on the PC and Tom had become editor. Somehow he had paid somebody off and become editor in chief of next gen, which was like the coolest games magazine in the U S and this is before, you know, really the dawn of legitimate online games journalism. And, you know, Tom was really the top guy uh, in, in, a, in a very serious way for, you know, cool, culturally relevant, you know, game news and also, you know, like breaking news about what was going on. And it was right. At, it was a really interesting time. It was right at the dawn of games becoming popular media and not being the sort of shit that was equated right. like, with, oh. you know, teenage boys and skateboard criminals. Yeah, so to be fair, the competition to be the top game journalist in the space back then wasn't nearly as big as it is now. So. Hey, man, the politics <laughs> are never worse than when the stakes are low, Tom. Got to keep that in mind. I, I like hearing that, Seamus, from your side. Of course, we got to flip our attention over to Tom. Now, Tom, you're, you're the up-and-coming games journalist trying to be the top dog. How do you attach yourself to Seamus, and how does that help your business and your work? Right, sure. Well, um, Seamus was at Looking Glass. I didn't really know him when he was at Looking Glass, but I knew Looking Glass because I had just started uh, working for GamePro on the West Coast, and Looking Glass was in Boston, uh, which is where I was from. So I was all about like meeting my hometown developers and seeing what was going on back there. And um, I really liked the, the crew at Looking Glass, really a bunch of really smart guys, and Seamus was part of that. And then he moved to the West Coast as well to join DreamWorks, and was involved, uh, I was spearheading, you know, the, the Trespasser project that, which was super ambitious, um, you know, PC game that was gonna introduce physics and he was taking advantage of the Jurassic Park franchise. And, you know, on paper, it's, it was the best story I could have been <laughs> chasing. At that point, I had moved over to uh, Next Generation Magazine. So I, I knew Seamus from um, the, uh, just going to meet him at DreamWorks, uh, I think the first day, I, I, first time I'd ever been to the DreamWorks office, and we hung out. Um, <laughs> I was introduced to his collection of airsoft rifles, oh. and uh, you know there were two parts of DreamWorks. There was sort of like the guys making the games, and then there were the guys making like the Goosebumps interactive, um, like you know, edutainment titles. And uh, Seamus uh, like sort of took me out the side door. He had like a uh, doors that branched into the courtyard and there were like goosebump signs on the opposite side and he said like you know when, when people weren't looking he used to like to shoot the goosebump signs with his airsoft rifles and we so we took a few shots at that and uh i think that that was sort of the beginning of our friendship right then well yeah, before or at least, at least yeah. trespasser was a total debacle and so i became basically radioactive and so being friends with me in the game industry at that time was like a big challenge so i i, I thank you for that radioactive that's an interesting one to say right there Seamus is that how you felt Tom was it hard to be around him or did you say yo that was a really you know ambitious project as you said and he shouldn't have been seen like that yeah so I mean I listen um I was the previous editor at next gen at the time so the more crazy ambitious game you had to tell me about to bring to the readers was 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 for me that was you know that was editorial gold so Seamus is working on this big thing uh, it, you know, it was h super ambitious. Uh, they pro it probably, he'll tell you more than anyone, it probably needed it a couple more years, which the company just wasn't gonna give him to do. Uh, and so they made him ship something broken. Now, the, you, know, the, you know, he's the man in the arena. I'm the guy, right? We're writing the story. So again, like, if you wanna promise the world, we'll give you the real estate to, sit, to, to sell that. But on the, on, on the flip side, when you're done telling me that, you have to answer to our reviews editor, who's gonna say, well, you know, did you deliver on the promises or not? You know, we, we, did, we gave it a lot of coverage. So again, I, the expectation was high. 
And, uh, you know, and I, I think, you know, Seamus will be the first to tell you that it, it wasn't there. And so because it was so widely covered, it was, it was sort of, you know, widely, uh, you know, I don't know, panned, I guess would be the night. It, it was still it. widely covered. Yeah. After the, yes, and so I, I just felt bad. I felt bad. I, you know, uh, another good friend the of mine. The wideness of the cover was maintained after, after launch. Yeah, that was, it was hard. I mean, I, I remember coming, I remember when it came down to when the game was coming out, um, Seamus and I got on the phone and our, our mutual friend, uh, Rich Flyer, was like the marketing guy there at the time, uh, was on the phone with us. And uh, I, I knew the game was coming out three months and I, I just knew from where it was the last time I saw it that, that it wasn't gonna be pretty. So um, we did the classic jerky journalist thing, which I, I asked Seamus how the time machine was coming. And he said, he said, what time machine? I go, the one you have to build to get Trespasser done. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Now, but part of the beauty of that is as a journalist, you say that now, you know what a dick move that is on the developer side. Oh, for sure. Because you, because you, have, some, you have somebody, and I think I was like 28 at the time, right? And I had like the weight of everything on me. I had this fucking movie company that didn't understand that if you ship a bad movie, it doesn't like crash the theater. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like you know like it's just a bad film like and, and anyway the long story so okay so we go through that but tom still is my friend despite yeah. my my radioactivity despite my plutonium like uh characteristics actually more like radium is really hot and uh and then we continue on I, I actually don't know tom because i go to microsoft and i think my career is over like i had met bill gates because he's one of the early investors in dreamworks right and so you know, I should have DreamWorks, and I was this young kid. I'm working for Steven Spielberg. He's, Steven Spielberg's coming into your office and throwing darts with you and shit. And it's great, but there's also this horrible pressure, and it goes south. And I didn't have the maturity to know that I needed to instruct them how to, like, you know, give him more time. And everything goes to shit. And Bill Gates had jokingly offered me a job. And so I literally emailed him to try to take him up on it, and I went and interviewed at Microsoft. I think I was just going to fucking hide out. I was going to hide out. My career is over. <laughs> I had absolutely fucked up. And it was crazy, too, because at System Shock, we were shipping, like, five out of five games, and I made this flight simulator that, like, beat yeah. Microsoft Flight Simulator, which is, like, beating Call of Duty in our world today. And I was, like, a super golden boy, and I, and I had this vision about physics and emergent gameplay, and I put everything I had into Trespasser, and it wasn't enough because I was an idiot because I didn't realize that, I, you know, what I didn't know. So I was like, all right, fine. I'll stop. I'm going to go. I'm just going to do the job that I deserve, which is to be some fucking faceless program manager at Microsoft working on graphics. And I went there to fucking die, frankly, to Seattle. <laughs> the best part was I moved from, from Los Angeles. I showed up on the first day of 100 straight days of rain in Seattle. Oh. And I thought, I literally thought, like, this is what I deserve. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is, and, this is and, my new life. And you were gone. Like, that was it. Like, you had disappeared. Like, no one talked yeah. to you after that for a while. And I was not, radioactive. Not, I was not radioactive. we didn't want, but you just disappeared. Well, you know, to be fair, I, now that it's 20 years on, there were some people, including some friends of, some good friends of yours who used to be real shitheads, who have mellowed a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Who were unbelievably mean to me and caused me to run away. And, and, you know, and it's weird because I talk to those people now, I don't know if they remember or not, like through their own experiences, let's say in screenwriting of being shit on, like now, like being able to look back at how, how, how evil they were and to get perspective on it. But that's what 20 years does, right? You wouldn't be talking about a certain someone who may or may not be an occasional host on this podcast. I'm not going to. Oh, gonna, my oh. gosh. Oh, wow. Oh, my gosh. Wow. I didn't see. I didn't know we were going to have a connection here no, with one wait. of the hosts. OK. Well, so, no, so, so I give Tom great credit for continuing to be friends. And then the real question that I have is that, you know, things happen inside of Microsoft and I just can't help myself. And I start working on this project that I got to be honest, like and, and this is a hard thing to say in these like 20 year, you know, fr first of all. 20 year anniversary sucks because it's just like, oh, I'm going to die soon. Like, that's what that's what it really is. It's like, oh, I'm so goddamn fucking old because I don't you never stop thinking of yourself as like the young guy with the big ideas. But then you're like, wait, I'm oh fuck. I'm just not anymore. I'm, I'm now I'm that fucking old guy. But, uh, you know, 
you get you get a sense of perspective and at the same time you get this weird like temporal bias because Xbox as a thing like like everything like like shooters on consoles for Halo right it seems obvious it's like breathing in and out now it's really obvious of course it's gonna work right not at the time right I mean, at the time I literally thought you know that I had to work on something interesting and when I saw this PlayStation announcement how they're gonna beat the PC I was like fuck you because I knew the whole graphics plan from Nvidia 3d effects ATI everybody I knew everything about the PC. I'd been like, you know, writing physics systems, and I, me and Doug Church wrote, you know, along with Carmack, some of the first ever renderers for the PC that ran in real time, like full stop. I wrote some of the first fucking texture mappers ever, I by hand in assembler. I knew how to do it. I looked at the roadmap. I looked at what PlayStation was doing. And I'm like, fuck you, fuck you. You're not gonna beat me. Fuck that. Like we should put together a plan to crush these idiots. And then they put out an ad that said that Linux was gonna run on PlayStation 2 and it would run a spreadsheet. And then I was like, okay, now I have ammunition to go to some of these Microsoft dudes and get them to listen. But I was sure it was gonna fail. I thought I was I thought it was like a hobby project. I thought maybe it would get me fired. And I had to keep it really secret because I didn't want another trespasser. I didn't want to be called out again for something that was gonna fail. So I like really didn't tell anyone. Like I didn't really tell myself because I didn't want to get my hopes up too high. I talked to a couple of like a couple of guys who I really trusted. And then suddenly Russo shows up, essentially knowing the whole fucking plan. Like, out of nowhere. I don't even know how you did that. I don't know who it could have been. Like, and you started talking to me when the project, like, Xbox was literally, like, five people for the longest time. Wow. I, like, I don't know what magical powers you have, but that was totally extraordinary. And I was, like, so afraid. And I, and I know you didn't mean this. But at the time, it scared the shit out of me because I was like, oh, here's my failure again. This is it. Like now, I've even failed to hide out inside the big company. I even failed. I'm not even as good as like Dunder Mifflin. Like I can't even do that. That's, that's how it felt, Tom, from my perspective. Oh. Well, if I could, if I could jump in, because you're, you're leading right into a question I wanted to ask. And I actually want to ask Tom, Tom this, because I'm, I'm curious for his perspective. Being in you know in the media during that time period, I'm you know I'm obviously just just average Joe guy that like like to play games 20 years ago, and and I tell the story on on here all the time. I went to that E3 2001, saw the Xbox booth, and I go, this thing is never going to work. This Halo, this is not going to work. But I'm I'm curious, Tom, well, from just, your just perspective. so you know, inside that booth, I had Microsoft people telling me you spent a million dollars on this booth. It's going to fail. You're an asshole. <laughs> oh, so wow, that's on amazing. On the inside and the outside, we had the same yeah. experience. But go ahead, please. Okay, okay, but but like I was saying to Tom, I'm curious from your perspective, and obviously it sounds like you 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 got a heads up, some inside information as this project was coming together. What were you thinking from from a media standpoint with, with Microsoft jumping in? Because at, at the time, obviously, Nintendo is still huge with the 64. You got Sega with the Dreamcast. You know, PlayStation is out there. What, what did you think about Microsoft entering the console arena in gaming? Sure. So, I mean, Next Generation Magazine was really essentially, we could have just rebranded it Console Wars Magazine because everything we did was just sort of about... And back then, you know, like 30, 16 bit, 32 bit, you know, those 3DO, CDI, there was like a, you know, there was, it was like a seven horse race with only like one or two real contenders. But like it was, it was way more interesting, right? Because the, the, the barrier to entry was much lower. Uh, but, but, you know, Seamus and I were the generation of kids that grew up with Atari, right? Atari yeah. was the first console. Yeah. And, um, you know, and it set the ground, and it was the most successful, the Atari 2600 was really the most successful console, for, you know, for that, during that era. And then, and then it, it kind of, it crashed, right? That, the market crashed, and, you know, the console, consoles were a fad, right? They were, as quickly as they came, they were gone, and it was really Nintendo that resurrected the idea that a console could be a sustainable business again. And then, but then that was followed by Sega, and so we, we, we kind of lost our, the American sort of right to make console right a thing. And, you know, of course, Atari came back, and, but we had the Jaguar, which was laughable. You know, again, the 3DO, which may or may not have been successful if it wasn't priced at $700, right? So, like, again, like, everything, everything we sort of tried to do in the console space was just becoming more and more, like, I want to say, I want to use the word pathetic. And, uh, and yet, we have Sony... 
uh, entering and doing incredibly well. Sega um, and Nintendo, you know, making it a two horse race for years. So we think like, okay, well, here's Microsoft, right? Arguably the best, biggest tech company in, in the US at the time, um, you know, and we'd had Bill Gates on the cover of Next Gen like a, a year before. And, you know, talking a little bit about the PC's viability. Yeah, and you got to understand that at the time, Microsoft, if you think about it today, would be like if Facebook and Google were the same company, that's how Microsoft was viewed. Yeah, like, absolutely. It was yeah. the big one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're there was, right. There was nothing else like it. So, um, of course, Seamus just derailed me. All right. So, I, yeah. That, so, that was my point. I, you know, that's my media training right yeah. there. So, we, no, so uh, saying, Microsoft so for me, for us, yeah. For us, it was, it was exciting because we we're like, all right, what if, what if, if they get in, it's a, it's just an interesting story anyway, if they get into this space. Um, and it would be an, amazing to see an American console rise to actually to compete against the Japanese machines. And we, listen, we've been covering like great PC developers. We knew what, what the guys at Epic were doing at Unreal. We, you know, we've been following the id stuff for years. You know, there was some, some great stuff happening with like, you know, Command and Conquer and the team that teams at Westwood. So we knew there were like these great Western developers that were really kind of killing it on the PC. Well, what if we had the, what if they had an opportunity to do something more interesting on a, on a console? Like we knew those guys could be, and plus we, you know, we had some, we had some emerging talent here on, uh, just on the game console, like, you know, with Insomniac and um, Naughty Dog. So, so. Again, but we then thought, all right, well, what if there was an American console that could sort of help raise the bar here? Right. Even before we really knew all the, some of the technical stuff that Seamus was, was planning or, or how they would kind of like, how they were gonna try to leapfrog the current gen of, of, of uh, and, and the sort of the technical hurdles that would go into involved, that were involved with part of the, uh, the chipsets, the way they came back from Japan, were always very difficult for Western developers to work with. So I'm kind of getting into the weeds here now, but the point being is we knew like Microsoft could potentially do it. And again, I think that's why it, that's why it got to me as quickly as it did, because even though Seamus was only, even though there were only five guys at Microsoft working on it, people at, at Microsoft knew about it and they were excited about it, especially right. like people that had gaming backgrounds at Microsoft, because they were like, you know, it, it word got out. And there were a few people talking to bigger third parties about it already. And, and then there were also, um, you know, within the games group, that development group, there were people talking about it. And it was my job to know about these things. So when I heard it come to me from two different sources, from two, you know, that, that kind of worked from different poles, uh, you know, at, at within, within the greater sort of games e e uh, ecosystem, you know, one from a third party publisher, uh, one who talked to third party publishers and one from the development side, I'm like, all right, this is, Two people have come to me with this now uh, from very different routes. And so it's the thing, right? Once two people tell you something, it's basically, you know, basically you have a story. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. and then I called Seamus and I said, hey, I hear you're involved in this console thing that Microsoft's developing. Yeah, one of the, one of the worst days of my life. And you may not even know this story, Tom. So, for, okay, first of all, I'm just really, look, look um, I'm really happy that to hear Tom telling his side of the story. Because I think that, you know, um, one of the great things about the games industry that I love is that it's an industry not just of the content creators, but it's of the content creators and the fans and the glue between them. All the journalists, guys, like, you know, guys here, I'm kind of funny. Like, we're all a part of the same, I, it feels all the time to me, like we're all a part of the same group and we're all sort of aiming at the same goal. And we like battle with each other. But, you know, if, you know, some mainstream media guy or somebody from outside our community comes in and tries to shit on games, we're all there together after it because we all feel like we're part of this same thing. And that's what's a great thing about games. So I think that Tom's part of this story is, you know, as important to tell as the development of the console itself because Microsoft's huge hurdle here was getting over a cultural issue of like it being Microsoft, it being the beige fucking gray company that makes really boring, stupid business software that crashes to blue screen all the time. And like, suddenly we're going to entertain you. Like that's, that didn't even make any sense. And I always assumed that Tom got his information from, you know, cause I get one of the things that I, I lived that I faced, like, you know, working on this project was all the people at Microsoft who were really skeptical, who like, didn't want to like, who tried to stop it because they thought that a game console was going to like wreck their career. Like guys in the hardware group. They got a name internally, Coffin Box. 
that the guys who made the mouse or the game controllers, a couple of them called it coffin boxes. They're like, you're going to come in, that you're the new guy, you're going to make a lot of noise, you're going to fuck everything up, our project is going to get canceled, then your project's going to fail, and then we're all not going to have a job. Fuck you, stop. Right. I always figured it was, and literally that got, like, I would hear that once a week from somebody. And it would kill me because I was like, oh, you didn't need to be right. <laughs> That that might be what's going to happen, um, and so I figured those were the guys talking to Tom. So that actually warms the cockles of my soul, whatever those are, to hear that Tom heard positive things. But uh, no, but you gave me one of my two day, two worst days uh, in media on Xbox. Okay, the the one only slightly worse than what you did to me was at E3. I think the same you were year you were there, Paris. Yeah, there was a CNN reporter. Uh, with like the live camera and they used to do the satellite shot where you, there'd be like an anchor in New York and you'd stare into a lens and they would ask you questions on a headphone or on, on, a, on an earpiece and you would have to answer the questions, right? And terrifying to do for Microsoft because you have all the Microsoft PR people there telling you that if you fuck up, you're going to screw up the share price and all this kind of like really big pressure, wow. which is not cool. Yeah. Oh yeah, and remember, this is at the, during the time when the Department of Justice was suing Microsoft to break it up for antitrust. Yeah, that is true. Okay, and this was on the news every single night, and this was a huge big thing because it was brand new, the idea of that with a tech company, and it's a big deal, okay? And, okay, so I'm getting ready to go, and the producer who's standing there next to the camera, you know, this like, you know, who's like a 22-year-old, you know, brand new graduate of somewhere, says, okay, so this is going to be really easy, kind of fun. We want to talk about games and like, you know, Microsoft consoles and you just, you know, it's a general audience. Just remember that. I was like, okay, cool. And say, so, okay, and go, right? And I hear the question, you know, I, I get introduced and this is, you know, Seamus Blackley and Xbox and all this. And the anchor says, so... Microsoft is being sued by the Department of Justice for its monopoly power in software. Why does Bill Gates feel that he needs to extend oh, that monopoly man. into games? And I'm like, <laughs> what, what do you say? So I, I, I came out okay. I said a good thing at that, which is basically I fucked Sony. I said, if you understand the games industry, you would understand that the monopoly in games is the Sony Corporation. And so I think that within this industry, people will welcome Microsoft in order to introduce competition back into the marketplace. Right? Okay, good. Survived. Kept my job. All good. Well, nice. Very nice pivot. Here's the, here's the less happy one. I am driving with the Microsoft PR crew, the people who do the media training, the guys who are on my ass for the CNN thing, in a rented van in Los Angeles to the motion capture studio where we're doing the motion capture for, if you recall, we had a demo with a giant robot and a woman who controls the giant robot with her mind. It was like one of the big Xbox demos. You don't have to know it, but it's, it was one of the things. I'm driving to a place called House of Moves here in Los Angeles where Blur Studio, uh, led by, by, uh, by my good friend Tim, who directed Deadpool, um, is making this demo for Xbox. Tim and I made a bunch of the demos for, for the, the early demos for the Xbox to pitch it internally and then externally. And I'm driving with all of the PR fucking dudes in this van because the PR dudes, as you know, they want to be in on the action. They don't want to just be marketing guys. They want to see it happen. And like, you know, right. and what do you do? You can't invite them to watch like 50 people in a room typing 3D code. It's boring. They want to come to the mocap session. Okay, so they're driving to the mocap session and I'm in the van and I'm driving and I'm trying to get, trying to figure out where the hell we are. Cause they're, if you recall, Tom, you've been there. The House of Moves office was in a weird place. And I'm driving up around, and my phone rings, and it's Russo. And, and I have the whole PR crew. I have, like, three PR people and one consultant from, like, Edelman, this big PR firm, in the car with me, right? And it's like, Tom. And I think, okay, cool. It's like Tom Russo. I was like, oh, it's my, it's my friend Tom. He's a journalist. He's like, hey. Tom goes, so, tell me about the game console you're making. And I'm like, how the fuck do I answer that with all the PR people in the car? And so I'm denying that we're making i'm like no 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 there's no game console right i'm like driving to the mocap session with the crew and i have the, the pr guy saying what's he saying what is he saying what are you saying you can't say we're doing it you can't deny it though but if you deny it he'll know and i'm like can you, can you all just shut up and i don't even remember really what i said and i have no idea if it was credible or anything to you at that point but i knew because you knew everything you knew the guys working on it you knew developers we were talking to you knew technology you knew nvidia you knew NVIDIA? And like the graphics chip at that point for the Xbox was like me getting drunk with David Kirk, who was like the chief architect at NVIDIA, over sushi for a couple of nights. And you knew about this. I, it was remarkable. It was a remarkable achievement. And it made my day and my week bullshit, by the way. So fuck you. All right, just doing my job. On that note, 
I, I actually have another question. Just how you're talking about how internally at that time, there were so many people that were kind of against the, the console even being made, right? For various reasons. But when I go back and I think about the Xbox 20 years ago, it was pretty ambitious at the time. Like one thing that really stands out to me is the fact that it had broadband built in, right? Broadband was like a really brand new thing. Not a lot of people had it at that time. The fact that you had a full on hard drive in, inside the Xbox at, at, was also something that you didn't see back then. So to to have such an ambitious console, I mean, you, you clearly had to have a lot of buy-in from that because like i said this was doing things that maybe the dreamcast was doing a little bit but nintendo and playstation absolutely was not at that time uh, yeah i mean don't confuse buy-in with like the balls to make things public before they're approved <laughs> okay i mean there's that and and uh once it got to a certain point i just wasn't gonna fail again and i was gonna do whatever it took to make it work and part of that is really like you know the trespasser lesson was aim really high and then get there. And, you know, aiming low just so it's easier, it just gets you, you know, gets you bullshit. They, like we have a thing, like, there's this, this ancient game developer saying, which is a late game is only late until it ships. A bad game is bad forever. Right. Yeah. Okay. So aim high. And that was the thing. And, you know, the, there was a direct trade off, for instance, like the giant Duke controller. That was a political battle that I chose to keep the hard drive. I let some guys, there you go, that's my baby, you can land a helicopter on it. It takes, yeah, to dock it, it takes a, a tug a tug controller to pull it into port. Um, the uh, the trade-off was let them do whatever they want on the controller in order to keep the hard drive, because the hard drive was like the key thing. Yeah. And, you, you know, to all of us who are making games, especially PC games, right, multiplayer was all there was. That was the future, it was clearly like, something that was extremely important. But at that time, it was hard to even explain to people what multiplayer was. I mean, you know, online games or network games, LAN parties, all these things in within the community were really clear, but to explain it to like civilians, you know, was impossible. And that like, so, so Tom, this is a question I wanted to ask you, which is I was in there like pushing for all this shit because I came from PC development, but I was a console gamer. I was an Atari guy from birth. And I knew that we had to have LAN and connectivity and the hard drive. I mean, even just to satisfy the giant video card I wanted to put in. What were you thinking about that? Did that seem stupid to you at the time or did you get it? Did people get it outside? No, I mean, I, well, I mean, I was working at, you know, Imagine Media at the time. So we had single console magazines like PSM. We had PC Gamer. We had Ultra Game Players. Like, we had like we had like this consortium of of all these editors that sort of champion different systems, uh, you know, or different enthusiast enthusiast base. But um, all those editors, in some way or another, sort of touched next gen. Uh, whether they did freelance reviews for us, occasionally helped with features, um, or or some some freelance writing, because we were a small staff and we had to cover everything. And and so we had this in house expertise that we would tap. But like, again, like I think we knew because we kind of were always looking at what everyone else was playing, uh, you know, within the, those core fan bases. Like, like we knew that there was, there were think there were great things about every system, including the PC, that sort of made sense. Or if you were going to drive like what what the future experience was, which was really what you know again part of what the magazine was focused on is where where is this space going and and so. For us, like that again, it just kind of made sense. Like, if you once you've played like like back then, like once you played Doom Deathmatch, or um, you know, or at the time like Duke Nukem 3D uh, was was pretty was pretty big. And like again, like once you had like that Deathmatch experience, like multiplayer Deathmatch, like you were kind of like you know, like console gaming felt a little static, right? Like you're like, why? Yeah, right. we... that's, that's all you can think about. It feels it's like it's like when you walk up to a computer that has no internet connection, it just feels dead. It's like I can't we can't use this. Right, that was, and, and we would have that feeling because we'd play those games, but like the big audience of console gamers out there, you know, didn't have that experience yet. They didn't know. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, yeah, go Tom. So I, I think that like, again, to Shane's point, like like all, all these other things that were part of sort of what the Xbox experience would become, the hard drive, like those are all instrumental, um, you know, uh, the broadband, uh, but I think 
from a core concept, one of the things that I think made me most excited, and then when, 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 when Microsoft finally got to them, I'm jumping ahead a little bit here, but when Microsoft finally sort of said it was okay for us to talk through, an, through official channels once, once, the, once, the, once the project had been revealed, which was about a year later from when we when, when I first. Oh, yeah, I forgot about. that we would talk, and I thought I was going to get fired every time every time I talked to you. But, but yeah, anyway, go ahead. I forgot that. Once we sat down to really sort of figure out, like, sort of, okay, well, what's the soul of the machine? Like, what what's going to you know? When we started talking about the architecture, it was that you know, Seamus had spent enough time around consoles to understand that, like, every time you know, Sony came out, every time a, 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 a Japanese console manufacturer came out with a new machine. There was some new archaic, I won't say archaic, but there was some new very uh, specific chipset that you had to then learn and, and develop for. So you're working on your PC and then you're trying to make something work on this crazy dev kit and you're spending a lot of time fighting with the hardware to, to make something work. And what the Xbox was gonna do was just use off the shelf and just like Seamus's idea from the beginning was let's just use off the shelf uh, PC parts put them in the machine, make sure they're powerful enough that people can run, and let's just let developers make the games on the PC without having to start with the hardware. Be, uh, stop having to fight with the hardware because the more time they can spend making the game fun, uh, the more time, that's it, right, the more time they, the less time they spend fighting with the actual hardware, the more time they have to make the games more fun and more interesting. And that in and of itself was gonna move the industry forward. Which if you look today, that's exactly where we are because we're using x86 architecture now on, on Xbox and PlayStation. So it just makes makes dev easier. So see, you're, you're innovating even back then. I mean, in some ways, the Xbox really screwed the PS3, right? It, it would come a generation later. Uh, people would, people didn't, developers no longer wanted to work on that like cell and especially Kudaragi was up in his uh, ivory tower making the cell processor which i'm sure i know in and of itself and Seamus would probably vouch for it is is an incredible piece of technology at the time but again like no one wanted to have to relearn how to do things again every right. five years and throw the baby out with the bathwater just to get a hold of this new tech that was somehow going to make things better well, that was the that was the central focus of the whole thing. And the original proposal, the first thing I thought of on the airplane was exactly that. And it was just come from being a game developer. But there's there are interesting like you know there's interesting context. Like one of the things was that one one of the one of the things I'm proudest of on Xbox is that we forced Sony and Nintendo to do developer support. And I had I had like you know, 15 years ago, developers come and thank me because suddenly they were able to write games on PlayStation 2 or PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, because there were suddenly libraries and documentation. Because Sony had to compete with the fact that Xbox had documentation, you could figure out what the hell was going on. But there was a culture in game development at that time, which was a real kind of like a He-Man, Wild Kingdom kind of a fucking thing, where you had to be good enough technically to be able to work on a console. And like it was only the best, the very best developers, and they had a lot of ego about this, who were able to get a PlayStation 2 to even draw anything, man. And so, um, it, to the point that Sony actually, internally and externally, would message that that was part of the reason that PlayStation games had such a high level of quality. Because the bar was so high to figure out how to do fucking anything. And that cell processor was a very interesting beast, you bring it up. People ask me about the cell processor all the time. I'm glazing over your eyes. I apologize, everybody, and I apologize for being a boring fucking nerd. But the cell processor was like a dragster with cardboard tires. It was like a dragster built by people who had never driven a dragster before. Very powerful, totally useless. Totally useless, right? And the huge advantage we had in the PC was like, okay, x86 architecture might be clunky. And that'd be the weird companies like, you know, 3D FX that have like weird marketing and like, you know, uh, have demos of like weird snake ladies and shit. But the graphics architecture was built by people who had been building graphics architecture right. for 20 years. And so you could actually use it to make, to draw beautiful pixels. And the tools actually work with it. And like, it actually go fast. And so it's kind of like the difference between you know, a guy who's like pointing at his polished engine compartment and how powerful his engine is and like what his dyno score was, right? And the guy with the junkie car who just kicks the shit out of him because he makes the time because he's engineering toward that win. And that's what we were trying to be. And I'm still passionate about it now. I'm really passionate about it. I hate bullshit. And it comes, I think, from being a physicist. But like, you know, 
there's there's the way nature is going to work and then there's the human idea of how it should work and nature does not give a fuck whatsoever about what you think should happen you know and you just need to get your head around that when you two look at the ecosystem now that phil spencer and the team over at xbox is building and we look at game pass did you two think back in the day 20 years ago that we'd ever get to the point where there is this moment where developers are empowered to make the games they want to create without having the sense of dread and feeling of if we mess up this is going to be over forever well tom should answer this but i just want to point out that a sense of dread is a healthy part of being a game developer yeah <laughs> um I, I i still feel like uh well i, I would say as 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 wonderful as game pass is and i'm a big supporter of it big uh, i feel like just it takes the fear of discovery and putting putting money down for something that you may decide later you you don't or you like or don't like and it's, it takes that gamble it takes the gambling out of it um is uh the fact that back when uh you know when when Seamus was still getting started like games were much cheaper to make you know generally speaking um but there was no indie scene either so you ended up with a lot of like sort of expensive i would say more expensive failures or or products that ended up being terrible um but there, there was no scale to the industry back then you know but there were just a lot more projects because you could build a you know back then a, a like a a, a top selling you know 16 bit thir, you know 32 bit game could be done for you know 500k to a million of course those are <laughs> those were in, that would have been a lot yeah, and those are that, that's in yeah, and that's in nineteen ninety nine dollars, you know, or nineteen ninety eight dollars, ninety seven dollars. But uh, but now you know you look at what people spend, and there's just yeah, so we you know it's it's been nice that the in, there's been this indie revolution, and that you know and we can move back into two D without it feeling like we're going backwards, right? right. You know, there was that whole in that whole push to three D, like people didn't want two D games anymore. Even though the the 3D games were really clunky, and you know, you look at the first generation of 3D games, they're really fucking ugly. But you know, again, it was all part of the evolution. Um, and now you can look at stuff. Now you know. Now you look at you can. Look, there's some be some beautiful 2D games out there. And uh, but uh, but again, and that whole indie scene has evolved. So so there's there's been there's a whole ecosystem of games that didn't exist back then that exists now. And again, like again, I think Game Pass is is in that position where it can sort of help uh, foster uh, growth for, uh, you know, for, for some of those projects. Well, I think that people get confused about games being a content or a technical technology business. And when games stop making sense and you can't figure out what the hell's going on, it's probably because you're thinking about games as being about technology and they never have been. It's always been about art. It's always been about art, you know, from, from the very first video game on, it's been about how it, how, the art in a game and the art of the game itself connects to people. And when you put that first, you can succeed. And when you think there's some technological trick to it, and we're, we're now seeing like NFTs come up as like the next technological trick. Here's a FinTech technique that's gonna make a bad game still make money. Okay, no, a bad game is still not gonna make money. Um, but you know, the, the thing that really has changed in the industry is much for the better. And I think this is, you know, uh, responsible for or is you know, a parallel consequence of the rise of the indie scene is that the audience is educated. The audience thinks of games as entertainment in the same way they think of a film or a TV show as entertainment. And that even seems weird to say now, but it was really a controversial, fucked up thing to say in 2001. Um, and that fact means that things like Game Pass make sense in the same way that Netflix makes sense. And I exactly. think that people think of Netflix the same way as they think of Game Pass. The people who don't see that aren't the audience. The people who don't see that are the executives of game companies. Um, because they're still thinking of their business as being basically about box product, and they're trying to fit all these models into a box product mindset. And I think letting go of that is what we need to do next. Because, you know, I certainly don't think like, you know, like, uh, you know, when, when we turn on the PlayStation or turn on the Xbox, you know, it's like, what is there to play? Let's go look at what's new. Let's look at what's really cool. And then you just get it and start playing it. Um, and that's how the model should work that's like the fantasy that i wanted since the atari in the 70s man uh and we're lucky for it and so hopefully at some point the business guys will get their head around you know actually addressing the fucking reality of the situation 
uh, instead of continuously trying to cram it back into, you know, uh, a DVD in a box model. He said bitterly. I want to rewind one more moment really quick because I love the dynamic between you and Tom here of the creator and the journalist. And maybe if we could rewind back to 20 years ago, what was it like talking to Tom and maybe sharing information with him or building this friendship? Like you said at the beginning, you felt like you were going to get fired or the whole world was going to burn down. Did that ever switch? Did that always stay persistent? What is that feeling of journalist and creator and the dynamic between you two throughout this 20 year friendship? Well, I mean, I'll, so I'll say something, but I really want, I want to hear from Tom, but uh, I was terrified of Tom and I had that terrible call in the car. And if you've ever had to do a call with a journalist who's figured the whole thing out in front of the PR staff that wants nothing to leak, you know, that was not, that was not a banner day for, for uncle Seamus. But uh, I realized, you know, Tom was my friend and Tom was a good guy and he's a gamer. And this is something that I think is incredibly special about games is that when you talk to somebody who's really a gamer, you know, you, you have potentially a connection with them that's really honest and deep where you actually both care about the same thing. And so you kind of know you can trust them. Mm -hmm. And I felt that with Tom and I, you know, I'd known him before too. And, and it's true. Tom is just a very, he's, he's, you know, he's like the best of us. He's a really good man and he's a real gamer. He cares about these things so much. And I realized that the feedback from Tom while he did his journalism was really important. And that if, if Tom was excited about what we were doing, then we were probably doing the right thing. And, and, and Tom, as a source of actual customer data feedback very early on in the process was really important. And so that's how I thought about him. And, and I really came to trust him so much. You know, I mean, our relationship went from that to at some of the lowest points in my life, I have gone to Tom for help and he has helped me. And it's because of that bond from that time. And that's incredibly special to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know that I can articulate it better than that, but it is, it is very special. And like, here's the other thing too, is like, Seamus has this giant brain and he's gonna solve problems that not a lot of people that I've met, and I've met a lot of people in this industry, that he's uniquely qualified to solve incredibly difficult sort of math problems but also he, you know, he uses both sides of his brain. He's not just an engineer. He recognizes the art. He recognizes that, you know, again, that games are entertainment first and that games have to have a soul and a, and a purpose for existing. And, you know, the, the, the humanities uh, aspect of it. So um, when he's up there, you know, kind of like trying to carve out a games culture in a place that's really you know, a productivity software first, you know, uh, company, uh, he's got this huge challenge in front of him. And I knew what he wanted to do. And again, I, you know, he was working with other people who are great guys too. I knew that, A, I knew that he cared and I knew that he had the, I knew that he had the right ideas and that as long as we continue to talk and um, the, the thing is, is that I was in a lot of ways, I was his biggest, I was the company's biggest critic, but I was also his biggest supporter because when I saw them pushing back against things that he knew were wrong, I would call them out on it. And I would, because they would, you know, again, they would make dumb mistakes, right? I mean, like you look at, I mean, I look at the Duke controller, right? You know what? We had, a, we had, a, I remember we had a joke at the, uh, at the next gen office when, when the Duke, when we saw the Duke controller, uh, Albert Pinello, who was like sort of the, the hardware, uh, the face of the hardware marketing guys uh, at the time was this guy that we knew him from EA because he'd been a product manager on like the strike games and stuff. So again, when you went up, when you went, if you were in the games industry at that time and you went to visit Microsoft, you saw, you go to the cafeteria and there were people from all these other game companies, like the, the uh, all working there and like the, the acceleration and the amount of people that they hired to sort of come in you know, these four millennium buildings were all of a sudden just staffed with games people like on their road to sort of launch. And it was, it was just incredible how quickly the company moved. Um, we used to, but we, we joked after we saw the Duke, we drew, we drew Albert Pinello with giant hands because like, you know, he was the hardware guy and yeah. the controller was so big. And there's another story behind that. I don't know if I'll get Seamus to, to tell that story today, um, why the Duke controller was so big. Uh, but, uh, uh, 
It was because of Albert's big hands, man. That's why it yeah, was. No, because the album Metallica, then, because the board inside was manufactured by someone who uh, before, uh, and the board for the controller was done before the before they realized it wouldn't fit in the casings. So they had all the controller chips done, and again, so they had to build the they had to build the the uh, the controller around the board. Do you know? You, do you, you don't know? You don't know the deeper, like more mysterious and creepy, like maybe even after twenty years, it's not okay to say story with that. I mean about the nepotism, about how it got that project got sent to a company yeah, okay. where someone. You know, have... and, and and that the guy who had the nepotistic relationship was later fired for some really creepy shit. Yeah, so that was it. so the Duke was really like quadruply cursed coming out of the gate, man. <laughs> and there's this one, this woman Denise who was the industrial designer, um, who, would like, I would go visit her in her office, and this is like I I had to let it go because politically there was nothing I can do. I needed to stay on the on the hard drive, and I needed to go get developers in Japan, but I would still go see Denise Gaki, and Denise would sit in her office and cry. Because it was like, you have to make a game controller, and she'd have like a PlayStation controller, a Nintendo controller, and a Sega controller, right? And they'd be like this big. And then the circuit board for the controller she was supposed to make was already this big. Now, did, she, did, and did, it was just like, oh. oh. Denise, Denise Gokey worked at Edelman. That must have been a different Denise. Oh, that's right. No, this was, uh, that's right. Uh, not Denise Gokey. What was her name? Anyway, so uh, it was, but it was, a, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, terrible and tragic story when we as we start to ramp down our time together guys as we look back we're celebrating 20 years and we talk about the culture that you two really created and formed and saw blossom throughout these 20 years do you look back on that vibrant green this giant duke controller that i hold in my hands and that big xbox behind us and do you think man this left a really positive impact on the gaming space can you believe that we've gone four generations of consoles with Xbox and Microsoft? Well, if you throw a Duke controller, it indeed leaves a giant impact. I'll give you that. <laughs> it's like that. Well, kind of like Meteor Crater in Arizona. It's very powerful. I don't know, Tom, what do you have to say? Yeah, I mean, kind of hard. It's hard, it's kind of hard to, to, to sum up, but uh, yeah, that's, I think, that's kind of a that's kind of a giant dick question, dude. I have to say, like, that's okay, like a nice. philosophical here's, question. Like, here's what I will say: because the only answer is like either shit on yourself or self-aggrandize to the point that like you need a drink. I, I can't. Mm -hmm. Well, let me let me answer because I was, I was not now. I was not the man in the arena. I was I was I was a war correspondent, and Seamus was taking all the bullets on the beach, you know. And uh, I will tell you that I don't think. Well, first of all. I would I think that the bulk of the success that Microsoft had with the Xbox 360 is because if, if the if the original if the if the original Xbox hadn't done or has been as competitive as it was I don't think it they ever would have they, that that was the beachhead on which the rest of the of the of the business was built and, and you know there were a lot of casualties along the way uh, Seamus was one I mean that you know that whole first wave. Of, uh, of, uh, of that whole first crew of guys that were sort of, that took the beach and installed that system and la launched that system, all, all got wiped out. Seamus, uh, Kevin Backus, I mean, the uh, Robbie Bach, all the execs, some of them, some execs of, lasted longer yeah. than others. Ed Freeze, um, but again, like even, but, but Phil Spencer was sort of the, he was the guy behind Ed Freeze and, and that group initially through that whole rise. And so again, like he was the he was the dude in Private Ryan who takes charge of that whole <laughs> team after they get wiped out on the beach and has to like lead the march inland, and that and that's kind of where we are today. So again, I think the, the legacy might be that that the guy who's there now like was kind of brought up by the guys who who sort of did all the heavy lifting to get the, the thing launched. And, I'm, and I I know Phil worked on the launch as well, but uh, but you know again I think. I think the tone that they set and the level of excellence that they sort of specifically, you know, strove for on a daily basis in the face in the face of a lot of hardships and a lot of naysayers is, is sort of what is what um, is I, I think that's the legacy that 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 Phil is, is part of in, in that he is he took direction from them and, and now is, is leading in their absence. 
Eris, any final questions for these two looking back on 20 years? No, I mean, not not a question. I mean, I guess just to wrap it up, I, I, I do think to kind of answer what you just asked them from my perspective, I do think that original Xbox was pivotal. Um, obviously, especially in console gaming, but I just think in gaming as, as a whole, as I look back over the past 20 years and I think about a lot of the personal memories that I've had and fun experiences and the connections with people that I've had, it started with that box. It, it really did. I mean, that's why I brought up the broadband uh, question because that obviously led to Xbox Live, which I think was transformative. Um, just so many early memories. I mean, you know, the Halo, like I said, I saw it at the booth, didn't think it would work. Wind up playing it like a few months later and just realized like, you know, everything that it's done for the industry. So I would just say personally to you, Shame, is I thank you. Thank you for having the vision and the drive to want to actually make something like the, the original Xbox during that, that, that climate 20 years ago and all the hoops and everything you had to jump through at, at the time because, you know, it's... It, it is remarkable that Microsoft was able to come into the into the gaming space and it did work because here we are 20 years later and we're talking about it and, and we're celebrating it. And like I said, I look back over the past 20 years and, and like I said, with that original Xbox and I just have nothing but fond memories. So many great, great moments that I've had gaming and so many people that I met because of that box. So so just a personal thank you for me. Oh, well, thank you very much. And I, I think that... Uh... I'll, I'll answer your question in a weird way. Um, when I look back at this and I think of the group of, I mean, frankly, of fucking numbskulls that we were trying to get this thing done. Um, and I think of the Bill Gates and the Steve Ballmer and all the other guys who we knew who were senior Microsoft guys, like Nathan Merville. I don't know if you know these names or not, or um, uh, Rick Reshett. Like who's a big graphics guy who's in charge of Microsoft research at the time, but all these very wealthy guys who had done incredibly well at Microsoft, which was, at that point was like a mature company, and they took a bet, a big bet on the company and everything with us, right? And yeah, like I remember the meeting when I basically threw a fit like a fucking toddler to keep the hard drive and the and the LAN connection in. I distinctly remember it. I remember. I remember what it smelled like in the hall. Somebody had burned popcorn when I walked out of the meeting. I remember these things very clearly. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I can trace a direct line between that and this Discord call right now. Like the fact that Discord exists and there is chat and video chat, I feel like there's some kind of like line there. And I don't feel like a sense of personal aggrandizement about it at all. I feel like I dodged a fucking bullet where I almost fucked that up. Does that make sense? And oh, I feel sense. an incredible sense of gratefulness to Microsoft and to Bill Gates and to the other executives there who didn't need to do any of this, they didn't need to listen to us, put up with our bullshit. I mean, we didn't behave well. We weren't professional. Like we didn't, we weren't easy to deal with. And, uh, and I hope that at other tech companies, because especially right now, given the world situation, I hope that at Facebook, I hope that at Google, there are similar cultures where a group of people with a really good idea can actually get it through and make things better. I hope that's yeah. the case. We were very lucky to have it, and I'm really grateful for that. And uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to talk to you guys and to give Tom his due and to give journalists their due in this process because we don't focus on that enough. And, you know, I got to be honest, that's a part of it, and it's an important part of it. And Tom has been a really important part of my life and, uh, you know, my best buddy. And I love you, man. Thank you. Thanks, man. I love you, too. We didn't even get to talk about how like you would fly down from Seattle and, and like just want to get drunk because you were you were so beat up from working, you know, to get that console launched. It was it was a lot of uh, nights where uh, we uh, we did some. Uh, there are times when you, when you do a project like that, and it's true of game development too, and and I'm sure it's true of what you guys do also. There are those times when like to keep the candle burning, you have to put a little bit of your soul in, and it just get burns away and. Those are the hard nights, and that's when it really tests whether or not you believe in what you're doing. So. Yeah. yeah, that's why we're going to launch a GoFundMe for Seamus' ongoing therapy, because it's not going <laughs> to yes. end anytime soon. No, and, and, and all of those around me who need me desperately to get therapy so that I stop treating them so poorly. All right. Uh, with that, Tom, I think we're done here. Yeah, Thank I think you so. Thank you very much.
<laughs> All right. Well, with that, having... that is Seamus Blackley and Tom Russo getting to tell some stories about Xbox and the 20th anniversary from the inception, the creation, and the friendship built over the video game console industry and this awesome culture of gaming. Thank you all so much for tuning in and listening. We'll be right back with more. And that's your show, everybody. It is the weekend, so go out and play a bunch of games. But don't forget this Monday, November 15th, 2021, we're celebrating the Xbox 20th anniversary. So please leave some comments down below. Tweet at me in Paris. Let us know all of your favorite memories and moments from 20 years of Xbox. And don't forget to tune in on Monday morning to catch all of the fun celebration coverage over on Twitch with Xbox and everybody involved. So have fun this weekend. Be safe and play a bunch of games, gamers. See ya. Peace.